I'm scared, I'm nervous, my anxiety is through the roof, and the majority of this was caused by two people. One with a resounding resemblance to talk show host Ellen DeGeneres, and the other was caused by a man dressed as a Spanish tennis player nicking off the number one and two ranked batsman in the world. But Australia not out of it yet, due to Diet Coke's number one ambassador, Usman Khawaja, who has already scored 141 runs in the first dig and looks the best of the Aussie batsmen on 30 for not out. I say best of the batsmen, but he probably looks like the only batsman comfortable. So this sets the game up perfectly. It could go down as one of the greatest test matches, but am I having fun? Not at all. I'm tired and stressed, to which Ricky Ponting will probably say, just take some Swiss multivitamins. But that's not going to solve this issue. The only thing that is going to solve this issue is Kawaja and Head putting on about 150 together and Australia waltzing home, breaking all kinds of records and chasing this down. Is that going to happen? Probably not. Winviz is telling me that's about a 5% chance. They're saying it's more likely that Hazelwood has to come in, 10 runs left, and it's gonna completely dictate my mood at work for the next day and probably the next week. So day three ended great for Australia. They got quick wickets and the ball started doing a bit on a pitch that was doing absolutely nothing before so. The clouds came over and it was looking good. They slowed the run rate down a little bit and I actually went to bed with sweet dreams of Baz Baller's fate. It can only be played on pitches that emulate Pakistan. That's the narrative I was going with since day one and that's the narrative I was sticking with. And within three overs of day four, Joe Root has decided to enter his Bradman era right as the Ashes start and throw a reverse sweep in first ball of the day. And then only a couple of overs later, he reverse sweeps Boland for six, hits him for two fours. This is Boland, Mr. Line and Length. This is Boland, Mr. Economical. And within three overs of day four, I'm angry. I'm fueled with hatred. I'm fueled with frustration. Because in my head, this is what ends test cricket. You're not allowed to do these kinds kind of things. You're in the middle of the game at a potentially a game-changing position. You can't lose a wicket at this point in the game, otherwise you could get skittled quickly and Australia can chase these runs. Yet you still have the nerve to take on these bowlers. You still have the nerve to stick with Baz Ball. And that hope of Australia that were dominating the night before when the clouds came over. That hope that the ball is going to start doing a bit. The hope that Baz Ball is fake and as soon as they lose wickets they're going to start slowing down. That goes out the window within four overs of day four. And I was annoyed. And the annoying part about being annoyed is, was it being annoyed or was it just being envious? Was it being envious that they were still able to slap Cummins, the best bowler in the world? Boland, Mr. Line and Length. Hazelwood, one of the best bowlers in the world coming back from injury. Did it annoy me? Yes. But I think the part that annoyed me the most was that I was envious, was that I was jealous that they were doing this. And the fact that they're taking a game that could very easily have been drawn out and ended up a draw, they've now turned this game into a thriller that is probably that is most definitely going to come to an end with a result either way. So not only does this annoy me as they're doing well in terms of their position in the game, not only are they helping their own position, they're actually bettering test cricket right now. They're the good guys at the moment. They're making the game interesting. And it doesn't sit well with me. It doesn't sit well with me. Because there's nothing worse than giving the English compliments, especially in the middle of a game. But at the same time, it is almost hard not to. I think Joe Root batted really well for his 46. I think Harry Brook batted really well for his 46 and looked really comfortable until he got out. Which brings us to Australia's bowling and field placement, which I thought was very important to cover as the commentary team only spent probably four out of the five hours of England's innings covering that. So getting the opinion of someone that's played really low level cricket all their life is essential. But also as much as I want to joke about the commentary team, it also does annoy me because I do agree with them. I don't like, actually I can't stand when players, especially new batsmen to the crease, are given boundary riders to turn the strike over to. When it's a set batsman like Root that's flogging you to all parts of the ground, I can make more sense of it. But doing it to new batsmen, it seems very defensive. It seems very against the spirit of Australia. It seems very against the code of test cricket. It seems only mandatory that when a new batsman gets to the crease, you bring the field in, you put the pressure on them. Don't let them get off zero. Yet pretty much at all times, I think Cummins probably had four or five people out on the boundary. And I don't know if that's me just having an old school approach and that you do have to change these fields now that Baz Ball is a... 
Uh, I don't want to say it, but now that Baz Ball is a thing, it's got to be approached different, which is why we got to spread the field. And maybe it's smarter just to restrict the runs. But it meant that Australia weren't able to get wickets in clumps. And it was a little bit of a frustrating watch as I'm sitting there on a Sunday night at 1am with a beer. I'm able to spot these things. I can see the flaws. But it did just seem odd that we're allowing batsmen like Brook, like Bairstow, like Stokes to get off the mark and start to get their eye in. Although when you do look at the innings as a whole. Bowling England out for 273 in the second innings on what seems a pretty flat deck is a pretty good effort. And although they didn't really take any wickets in clumps, they did seem to take wickets consistently. Whenever the game was starting to slip, they managed to bounce back with a wicket. Just as Joe Root was getting away, he was playing 360 degrees, lap sweeping bowling, smacking line down the ground, pull shots, cut shots. Just as he was getting on top and it felt the game was completely slipping away, Lyon manages to get one go past the edge, He's stumped. And then Brooks started to look really good. He was going almost a run and a ball. And again, it felt like it was just starting to slip away a little bit. And then he smashes one to mid-wicket. Then Bairstow and Stokes got going. And it looked like they were setting a partnership to take the game away from Australia to set an unchaseable target. But then Lyon traps him in front LBW. And then same as Stokes. As he was about to hit 50 at almost a run and ball. And he really started to up the strike rate. Cummins trapped him in front. So as much as we want to criticise the bowling and the field placements, they took wickets and they took them in important times. And they took wickets of innings that were a 50 that could have exploded into a really quick quick 100, 120, and taking the game completely out of our reach. So it does make you wonder, if we had that field up, would that have put more pressure on the batsmen, or would they have just gone over the top and managed to get to their declaration score quicker? Because it feels like we bowled pretty poorly and we made the wrong decision, but the end result actually isn't anywhere near as bad as what it feels like throughout that innings. It feels like we're getting smashed to all parts of the ground, but it actually ended up a pretty respectable chase. I don't think Australia did play overly well though. Lyon and Cummins were definitely the pick of the bowlers. They got the big wickets at important times. The only problem, and it's starting to become more and more apparent, is the differences of the tails between Australia compared to pretty much any other country. Just like the World Test Championship final and the first innings of this game, the tail always seemed to put an extra 50 to 70 runs at the end of an innings, whereas Australia always seem once their six wicket goes, they get wrapped up pretty quickly. And it does feel almost wrong to critique a bowler's batting ability, as it usually does, and it probably does mean Australia's top order need to be doing better. But you can't help but think, besides Cummins and besides Stark, None of our other bowlers really can hold a bat. And this could be another one of those games that come down to our inability to finish off the opposition's tail, combined with the fact that our tail is not really producing any runs at the end of an innings. The thing is, is there a fix to this problem? Probably not. Are the bowlers really the one that should be in the firing line? Probably not. Am I still going to complain about Australia until they're perfect because that's what Australian sports culture teaches us to do? Most definitely. So Australia ended up with having to chase a lead of 280, which is scary stuff. I feel like anything over 250 was always going to be a pretty big ask, which is kind of where some of my frustration of letting the tail wag comes from. Because it seemed like each run at the end of their innings, every single run, the statisticians were out and Australia were left to break another record in this run chase. And it's now ended up they have to get the highest ever run chase at Edge Baston, which just adds that extra bit of pressure which no one needs. Not the players, not me at home watching. But probably the most annoying part of this annoyingly hard run chase is the fact that Australians have very passionately been calling this pitch an absolute road for the last four days. We're throwing our morals out the window, we're throwing our pride out the window, and we're dying on the hill that Basball only works on a flat deck. Now the problem is, if we're going to play the card that Basball only works on a flat deck, and if we're going to use that excuse throughout this test, then we have to come out and we have to bat well. We have to make this pitch look like a road. Otherwise, Australian spectators are going to be held liable for thousands of thousands of hate tweets towards us and we have absolute zero ground to defend ourselves. So we needed to come out and make this thing look like a road. And they did for probably the first 45 minutes. Both Warner and Kawaja were batting really well. Warner, for probably the first time in a while, was hitting pull shots in front of square. And for a second there, for a a couple of minutes actually my heart rate probably settled down to maybe a steady 
60, uh, probably about an 80 BPM. But like all good things in life, they come to an end. And unfortunately, this one came to an end pretty quickly because Warner nicked off. And that was followed by Broad coming in and making this wicket look like a green top, making it look like there was cloud cover, making it look like batting had been impossible for the last five days. And he nicked off Marnus and he nicked off Smith, who, by the way, played particularly poor shots. And all of a sudden, we were three down for not many. And this chase is looking extremely over. Overwhelming. And you do have to say that Marnus and Smith kind of threw their wickets away. It is, again, pretty hard to criticize number one and two batsmen in the world. And it is a little bit of a tough spot in the game because you want to keep the strike rate ticking over. You want to put pressure back onto the bowlers. But it was an important time to hold your wicket and to go into the next day only one or two down. But both of them did get overly aggressive and they got caught trying to drive the ball. And now it's left us in a real awkward spot where... Again, it's gonna. it looks like Kawaj is going to have to be the man that stays around and gets some run. It does leave Kawaj out with a massive task, but he's doing really well at the moment. He's looking solid at the crease, much like his first innings. He's able to defend. He's able to attack. He's able to do it on his own terms. And he is helping. He's probably my glimmer of hope. He is the one keeping my nervousness nervousness bottled in. If it wasn't for him, I'd probably be on the verge of a mental breakdown, but he's keeping things in check for the Australians at the moment. And it feels like he will probably have to stay around and convert this 30 that he's on now, probably into an 80 or into a hundred. And hopefully with the help of head, Green and Carey, they can carry us over the line. But the game is definitely there for the taking. I would say England are maybe slightly ahead at the moment, although three wickets definitely doesn't look bad on paper. If you're an Australian fan, you know that three wickets can turn into eight in the space of about 40 minutes. So I would say England are slightly on top. I'm putting all my hope into Kawaja and Head and Green and hoping they can pull something out of the bag. Or let's just pray that Boland hits a quick fire 90 and puts it to bed in the first couple of hours. Yep, that's the story we're going with. The quick fire 90 for Boland and we get it done four down. Easy. Again, let's see if I hold that confidence coming back tomorrow.